For me, if you can, I, I want to bring in radio talk show host, MSNBC political analyst Hugh Hewitt, uh, also Washington Post political columnist Dana Milbank as well. Hugh, let me start. You. We know that, uh, that Bill Shine has, has quite the relationship with Sean Hannity. We know that Sean Hannity has the ear of this president. What, what can we make of what this announcement is going to mean uh, for the president? What is it going to mean for this administration and its message? Well, Bill Shine's a very excellent programmer, Craig. He spotted a lot of young talent, brought them into Fox News, even as he amplified the reach of Sean Hannity and others. So I think you'll see some uh, much-needed organization to the comms messaging, much greater infusion of talent down through the ranks, and a greater focus on, as you just mentioned, the Senate races in, uh, in the fall. And I think the Supreme Court rollout, et cetera, that will all be added to by Shine's presence in the West Wing. Dana Milbank, your response to the announcement that Bill Shine is, uh, is going to become a deputy chief of staff in charge of communications? Well, a couple of things, Craig. Uh, I think he will be the uh, seventh or eighth in this spot. Some have held it uh, multiple times. So it's a particularly uh, a difficult one to hold because this president is essentially his own communications director. Uh, very difficult uh, to get him uh, on, the, on, the, on the path you want him uh, to be on. It also uh, is, again, a furtherance of this president's uh, uh, fascination uh, with TV personalities. You know, and, uh, we've seen Larry Kudlow. We've seen uh, several others. Uh, he has a particular attraction, wants these people around him. We know that people like uh, uh, Lou Dobbs uh, uh, speak to him, uh, Sean Hannity speak to him on a regular basis. So I think the obvious thing is it's just a matter of time until he comes knocking on your door as well, Craig. <laughs> I, I don't know if, that, if that's going to happen, Dana, but thank you. Is Hans still at the White House for me? Can I go back to Hans really quickly? Hey, Hans, for, for folks who are watching and, and listening and might not be as familiar with this job, uh, in the simplest of terms, what does the communications director at the White House do? What is Bill Shine's day-to-day -day responsibility? Uh, what's that going to look like? Well, for your purposes, he'll be the one approving your interview with the President of the United States. <laughs> Communication director is doing longer term strategy, trying to figure out what the message should be, not just a couple of weeks out, but a couple of months out. They're really thinking over the horizon. The day to day back and forth, the cut and thrust, that's typically the press secretary. Now, it's varied in different administrations. Even within the Obama administration, initially the press secretary had a direct report to the chief of staff, the first press secretary. Then they ordered things around and had the press secretary report to the communications director. So the communications director is typically slightly above the press secretary, but they are thinking longer term. And the fact that Bill Shine is actually deputy chief of staff gives him even that much more power. He's almost on a footing with the other special assistants, and he can outrank some of them. I also think we should note that this is an old media play. We have no idea what 2018, the midterms, or 2020 are going to look like, in part because the media is changing so rapidly. You just mentioned Axios, a company that wasn't around really two, three years ago. So he's going with an old media executive in an environment that's going to be shifting and changing. And when you look at a lot of the energy on the Democratic side, they've been able to harness the Internet, harness social media in new and interesting ways. So, yes, Bill Shine has a great deal of talent. He knows how to make television. He knows how to put on television. And and spot talent whether or not he can find the voters in the new media environment that's an open question Craig this is a president who does like to surround himself with people who uh, have demonstrated loyalty and we, we know that before Bill Shine was a Fox News executive he was a producer for Sean Hannity and we know how much the president uh, enjoy watching enjoys watching uh, Sean Hannity's program Hans thank you so much for that at the White House uh, Dana let's go back to the the big story of the day here the Supreme Court short list as you look at these potential nominees is there any reason for uh, progressives like yourself or Democrats in general to be optimistic well I I don't think in the long run there's any reason to um, there is a slim chance that uh, uh, Democrats would be able uh, uh, to block this we see this multi-million dollar effort getting going uh, on the left targeting uh, senators like Collins uh, like Murkowski really they only need uh, a vote or two the difficulty with that is there is a mirror effort uh, on the right to target uh, a high camp uh, and Tester and, and Manchin and, and Donnelly and I, I think it, it probably 
Clearly, the right's uh, strength in the electoral map outweighs the Democrats here. And the thing is, even if they were able to defeat one of these, well, what's to say the president wouldn't come back with another one? Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult. The fight should be made, but it's going to be very difficult to, pre to prevent uh, uh, President Trump from filling the seat. Hugh, uh, will the conservative wing of the GOP have any problems with the, the three names that are thought to be front runners right now, these three, uh, these, these three sitting judges? No, judges Kethledge, Kavanaugh, and Barrett are all excellent jurisprudentially. Uh, Kavanaugh and Kethledge have 10 years plus of opinions that we can go over, so there's no suitor problem, and I think Barrett probably has the greatest possibility of being rejected by the Senate. But if you look at the upside on the map, uh, Craig, I think Judge Kethledge gets the nod because he's from the countryside, not from the <laughs> capital. Judge Kavanaugh is very much a D.C. person, extraordinary intellects on both sides, but uh, Judge Kethledge coming from Michigan, the, you know, Michigan undergrad, Michigan law, that's my alma mater. I don't know him personally. I just know what he's written and his opinions. Uh, you go out to campaign with Matt Rosendale in Montana tonight. You go with Kevin Kramer in North Dakota. You go with John James in Michigan. You go down to, uh, to Mike Braun in Indiana. I think the president mentioning Gorsuch and Kethledge, it gets much bigger applause, certainly in Michigan and in hunting states, than it would in, uh, if you mention Kavanaugh. And I don't think you take the risk of Barrett. Right now, I just don't think you take that risk. So it's one of the K's, I think. Really quickly, the risk of Barrett would be what? The greatest risk uh, to appointing her would be what? Uh, that she doesn't have a record that conservatives are, are comfortable with at the same time that people are afraid, like Dianne Feinstein, that the dogma lives deeply within her, which is an attack on her Catholicism, but you still have to worry about that becoming uh, an opportunity for a swing and a miss. He simply cannot get this wrong, Craig. You cannot blow this in September. His nominee's got to get confirmed in September. Amy Coney Barrett, uh, there on your screen. We're going to talk about her right now. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Dana. Jennifer Mack Award is an associate professor of law at Notre Dame. She also clerked for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She's also, for the purposes of this conversation, uh, a longtime friend of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. She is, of course, again, on that short list of contenders. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Jennifer Mack Award. What can you tell us about your friend Amy Barrett? What would make her a good Supreme Court Justice? 